Welcome to, I believe, number 11, 52 Launch Podcast. I'm Dan Gagne. I'm Peter Dranklich. And we're the co-founders of 52 Launch. Oh, so. okay. I forgot about that. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of our tagline on our TV commercials. But uh, yeah, look, at we appreciate um, the feedback we're getting. We watch our views going up. It's uh, it's pretty amazing that um, we've had this idea for a while. And again, I just want to give a sh- shout out to Evan Johnson, who's behind the scenes here, who helped us make our podcasts uh, really uh, to this next level, right? Production quality, the entire editing process and all our clips. So I'm going to just, I'm going to express to everybody, please like and subscribe, uh, share us with whoever you know is an entrepreneur. I think uh, the feedback we've gotten so far is just tremendous. And it's, uh, I know we are putting an extreme value to people who are in the entrepreneurial space trying to get a a product to market. Absolutely. Um, And again, this isn't just, you know, us coming up with a podcast. This is real life. The last, uh, you know, 25 years of our lives of experience uh, and the last five years is 52 launch. Uh, These are real world experiences on what is needed to get to market. Right. Um, I mean, if you just listen to our podcast, honestly, you could bring a product to market without hiring us, quite frankly. Um, It would take you a long time, but it's still- You um, could absolutely do it yourself. I do highly recommend that it takes a village. If you don't have a team, you're on your own and it's easy to go down the wrong path when you're on your own right you know if you don't have someone there to help you second guess or a team of people and again there's expertise right like so someone who knows marketing if you if you wear too many hats you you end up not being as good as you could be in all the areas that you need to be to start that's correct um so again this is kind of part two of our lisa d conversation Uh, lisa is a now a new client of ours uh, but this was questions that she had prior to hiring us and interviewing us and, and going through the process of, of uh, sharing her idea with us and, and what we felt. Which, and believe it or not, it were five years. We've never had somebody take uh, this much effort to uh, list right. out you know, a couple dozen very important questions that, um, as I alluded to in our last podcast, we just take for granted because uh, we do it every day. Right. Um, you know, she really, she really took her time, did some due diligence and, and really um, laid out what we consider a perfect roadmap to um, asking the right questions. Well, and I think that's what impressed us the most. Not only did she ask a lot of questions, but she asked every single one of these is the exact right question right. that you should be answering or asking and we should be answering. Um, and, and so rather than, look, let's put it out there. That's, a, that's kind of what we decided the podcast is around these questions that you should be asking and we're going to answer them the way we answer them. And uh, from that standpoint, you can you can evaluate your own position to go forward or make decisions and hopefully it helps you because again our number one belief is that everybody has an amazing idea they just don't know how to execute on it and if we can help you execute on it we can help you be part of that our whole goal at 52 launch is to is to launch the next big thing and we believe everybody has the potential to have that next big thing in their in their mind creeping around um, that that can turn into a product in an instant and so before we jump onto the market yeah. questions that she has, why don't we talk first about, you know, you know, does, how does my idea um, make money? Make money. Right. And, and then we can get to. I agree. The marketing. I, s- I agree. Side of it. Um, so that is a number one question. So to me, the only way an idea makes money is to have inventory that converts to dollars. Right. That's the business sense. Right. No one pays for an idea. And I know I think, you know, everybody believes that, oh, I got this great idea. Someone's going to write me a check for it. If you watch Shark Tank, there has never been, and I think, what are they up to? A thousand, there are over a thousand episodes, I think, at this point. There has never been anybody that they have funded that just walked into the Shark Tank without an idea. You see Shark, the, the, the tank itself, right? There's, what do they have? They have a display. They have product. They have a brand. They have all these things. These, these companies that are going on a Shark Tank have been in existence for a while, and do they all get funded? No, no. <laughs> of course not. No, no. Because <laughs> fundamentally, to to you know how does your idea make money what's the number one question on shark tank dan um what are your sales ultimately that's the question they 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 first shake their head when they hear the the valuation right (laughs) how you you can see it or uh, it's clear as day just look at the as the camera pans across the entrepreneurs and they obviously do it for a reason right when someone's asking for three hundred thousand dollars for five (laughs) percent of their company that you can see the you know the reaction from the entrepreneurs are like they roll their eyes or they're like disgusted um 
But ultimately, they allow that person to pitch, and then they ultimately say, all right, so sounds great. Now, you obviously have sold a lot of these if this is what you're asking for, and this is what you valued your company at. And then yeah. generally speaking, the next so question I, I, is, I love what one, are you I, thinking? Exactly. Yeah. I love the ones who learn how to lie and have watched the show enough to say, oh, yeah, I've sold $100,000 or I've sold $500,000 worth of, uh, of, of product. Wow. Well, how, you know, and, and the next question is, well, over what period of time? Right. Right. Because that's key. If, if I've done that over 10 years, 10 years then. <laughs> you don't have a business. That's not investable. That right. means it's, it's, it's just not generating revenue. You don't know how to find customers. Right. Now, if I told you that you generate, or if someone said they generated $500,000 in the last six months. Or a year. Or the year. 18 months even. That, yeah. That's significant. So, so that is what the investor is looking for. And the reason why they're asking that is, is why. Because they want to know how they're going to get their money back. Absolutely. That's, that's what the whole purpose of investing is is that you want to return on your investment yeah. everybody does it's either we've been doing this too long or we're just getting to that age but we couldn't remember who told us or someone told us one thing about investors that they have more money than time yeah and we're the exact opposite yeah, we right? have it's, more time than money we have more time than money that's and that's right. why entrepreneurs and investors are two opposite bookends but an investor doesn't want to give you money to research and develop and they don't want you to like they don't want to hear that it's going to take you three years to get to sales Right. They're not giving you money for that. They right. want to know that you are in sales right now and that all that you need their money for is to increase your marketing, which would automatically need, mean that you need more inventory in stock, right? Because if, you if you're selling product and you run out of product, that means there's a hiccup. Right. But those are the two things an investor wants to look at. Right. And we, so and we, all, we all don't really care a lot for, well, I happen to like them, but most people don't like <laughs> Mr. Wonderful that much because he's you know, a little arrogant. Um, but you know he does ask that question. Um, you know, if you can show me what it costs to acquire a customer, I'll invest, you know, whatever money you need. Uh, because once you've developed that cost of acquiring a customer, right. now it's just about spending more money in marketing and making sure you have enough inventory to, to ramp up. And those are the businesses that he loves. Um, the businesses, so, and I will say that, businesses that know to find the million customers have a tremendous value to an investor. Right. Right, because that's the hardest part is finding the sales making a product look at it, it's difficult and i don't want to take anything away from what the team does here it is extremely difficult but it's a process it is you know there's a process and there's steps and there's uh, there's reliability in regards to knowing each step of the process and what to expect sales i equated it on the last show it's like going fishing you don't know you're going to come back with fish you don't know when you're going to get your sale right. but sales isn't a question of if it's a question of when when you find those clients and you know how to find more of them right that's when your sales will happen increase and grow right it's very much like fishing like you said yeah I mean, when i go out fishing in the ocean you know you look for the birds you know to see yep. if they're diving they're diving in for the for the small fish because the small fish are being chased by the big fish or the other obvious thing is that you go out and look at the fishing boats and they're all <laughs> uh, you know congregated in this little area guess what's happening in that area well, fish so, abiding. So, so I grew up freshwater fishing <laughs> so, with my dad. And since I moved from Ontario to here, I really haven't gone because I don't know the fishing holes, right? right? So I hate going out. Like, I mean, look at, I love going out and I love being in nature, but like it kind of sucks when you go out to a, uh, spend an entire day on a lake and you don't catch anything right. or you catch crappy little fish. I remember uh, Mike, you know, our, our guy from, uh, from packaging came in and he's a big fisherman, sports guy. And I asked him, I said, hey, Mike, you know, where are your fish? You know, can you share some fishing holes with me so I can go out maybe with my kid and and, and go? I swear to God, I was like asking him for the Pentagon secrets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, and so again, but that's that's the same thing with sales. Right. It is that. See, when once you know how to find clients online, right. that is your blue sky. That is your asset. That is your secret sauce. And right. that's what you know. You can't. Other people can't duplicate or replicate. And that's really where. It's kind of like when you have that secret fishing hole, you don't share it with people. And that's because that's how you make a living. That's exactly. how you make your revenue. And our team's really good at finding those holes. So, yep. Um, so, again, we're going to bounce back and forth because I think, you know, how your idea makes money and how you get invested is really symbiotic, right? What's, if you had an idea eight seconds ago, let's say you came up with an idea, what's it worth? Um. <laughs> <laughs> so that's I know where you're going with this right. question. That's why I'm, you know, um, chuckling. I mean, again, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, people, um, yeah. Again, you said it. People do not, or investors do not pay for ideas. They're they're not for sale, and they're not negotiable. They're non negotiable. Um, everything is about the execution of that idea, exactly. not the idea itself. We all have 
probably a dozen great ideas in our heads. Every day. You Every come day up with someone idea. has them. That, that, that's one thing that's uh, there's an infinity of, and that's ideas. It's about the execution of that idea. Yeah. Um, and we preach that every single day. Matter of fact, it's a tagline on our back of some of our t-shirts that we've developed. It's, yep. it's 1% idea and 99% execution. Um, execution. I would argue that it's it's one one hundredth of a percent. Yeah. It just doesn't look good on the back of a t-shirt. But um, no, it's all about you know executing on the idea. And then quite frankly, that's why we started 52 Launch. Uh, it's, um, you know, we're that platform that can help anybody go from, you know, a napkin design to revenue. Um, we, you said it, Pete. It's a process, and we've really developed that process over the last five years. Right. Are we as good as we were, you know, four years ago? Absolutely, we I mean, we're a, a lot better than we were four years ago. And at four years ago, we were still very good. Um, yeah, and it, 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 it amplifies every year. Like you know, the first year there was a little improvement, but in the last year, I mean, we change every every three to five months dramatically. And again, it's not because you know when you, when you when we say we're an A through Z company. The alphabet just expands. Right. You know what we thought we needed today and yesterday are, are different than what we're going to need tomorrow. When a pandemic hits the entire world, right, and you know there's no more trade shows that you can go to, you either die or you adapt. Right. We adapted, right? We focused 100 percent of our effort on, and so year. did everybody else. Yeah, we had a great year last year, a fantastic year, and that's um, and again well, that'll continue because guess what? Um, I think there's a couple things that everybody has realized during this pandemic. Uh, traveling to your job sucks, right? We all, and the ones that had to travel during the pandemic enjoyed it because there was no traffic, but we're starting to see that that pattern is oh, changing. Um, and again, they're claiming now there's going to be this mass exodus that people are quitting their jobs because they hate their jobs, but they kept them during the pandemic because they got paid. Right. Um, but I think really what we're going to see is this mass exodus to the ability, and it's, it's, it's probably already started, but if you have an idea and you can bring it to market. You can be the only one selling it on Amazon. You can make life changing. Forget money. the fact that you're the only one selling it on Amazon. You you said it all the t- you say it all the time. You could be five hundredth yep. on the list on Amazon and still make an extremely good living, um, being number five hundred on Amazon, right. not, not number one. Well, I'm just saying, if you have a pair of sunglasses that are unique to you, and then no one else that can manage, the, you're not competing against someone else. You're competing right. against the market, right? Right. You're not competing against someone else who bought knockoff sunglasses from someone else, and now you're nickel and diming each other to no profitability, right? Um, but look at that, that's how you make money. You you have to have a product, and you have to you have to make sure that product is designed that solves a problem that clients are easily identify with, and have a little bit of a demonstration wow factor, or like wow, no one thought of that before. Um, that's that's kind of the key, and then you have to have the chutzpah. I'll say that to actually go and get it made. Go get it manufactured. Get yourself a tool. Build the assets that are around that. Make the investment. And, I, and I'm going to say this to you. Maybe I haven't said this before, but to me, the one percent turns into maybe five percent at the time that you make an investment in bringing that product to market. Right. So if if your idea is worth less than one percent, it's still worth one percent if you have a prototype. It's still one percent if you have a design. It's still one percent you have a CAD. The minute you start making the investment in a, into a tool, into inventory, into shipping it here, into creating an LLC, into a brand, into all these things, I think that's when you start reaching into the execution part and your value as a company goes up. But it's still until you get to sales, and let's let's talk about how many sales if i if i sold a hundred dollars worth of sales is that enough to be investable in of course not so what's that number right yeah i'm going to tell you right now that there's online there's companies that acquire online businesses single product businesses that will acquire you at the five hundred thousand dollar annual level right if you reach five hundred thousand dollars in sales uh, and people go wow that's that's a big number it's one of the fastest growth industries that one of the fastest right now growth industries are... is the acquisition of single products that are that have learned how to find and acquire customers and generate five hundred thousand dollars in sales right um, and they write big checks for those yeah and it's is it hard to get to five hundred thousand dollars in sales yes it's it's hard but it's doable it's doable for every product that we launch well so i'm gonna i'm gonna have i'm gonna force you into a definement here is it hard like swinging a sledgehammer and breaking big rocks into smaller rocks or is it hard because it just takes time and patience? Yeah, <laughs> we talked about this in our <laughs> several podcasts ago. Uh, you have to have patience to be an entrepreneur. And it's something I've had to learn at my age um, where I, I never had any patience. And after meeting this guy five years ago, I've learned to um, to have patience as much as it's hard. To, it's hard. No, I, <laughs> and 
but you know. but again, I just think if, if you you know when you when you put the um, when you put the system out there and you're selling online and the it's automated and managed enough where you know that every day you are finding more customers that are turning into and you're putting into your look like audiences and you're using the emails and the information that you have on on customer acquisition to keep improving your customer acquisition. Um, then you reach that tipping point. At some point after, if you just started the journey in three years, you'd be at that point where I think every every business has the potential to generate five hundred thousand dollars worth of revenue on a single product. Which means now you have an exit strategy in exactly. a small business, which is unheard of um, exactly year, years ago. So yeah, and, and and I'm not talking about complicating yourself with a ton of employees. Just nope. keeping it simple that you've got the assets to get to a point where you can produce enough product in a just in time inventory system where you're spending money in real time that you can afford building that cash flow up and, and maintaining your your time so that you can still maintain maybe your first job or your primary right. job. And what is that little tidbit of information called um, in our world? It's called research and development. You've done all the research and the development to right. get your company to two hundred fifty to $500,000 in sales, which now you're either fundable or you're sellable. You have an exit strategy. Um, and, you know, that... <laughs> It just again, I, I use this word a lot. It levels the Amazon has allowed us to level the playing field um, and allow anybody that has a great idea to generate revenue from yep. that idea. So I'm going to just rattle off the Shark Tank questions real quick yep. here. So you know, again, it's, uh, how your idea makes money. Your idea makes money by you focusing on what are your sales going to be. How do you get to revenue? In order to do that, the next question that sharks ask is customer acquisition, which we just talked about. Right. The third question that they ask is your cost to produce. Why is that? And, and, and you see the reaction when they find out that you have a good. Yeah, well, you, you want to be scalable. You want to make sure that you can actually manufacture right. the product cost effectively. For those reasons that we spoke in our last podcast, you need to have money left over for shipping and you need money left over for uh, the cost to acquire a customer uh, and fulfillment services. You have to have um, good margins right. in your so, product. So when you watch Shark Tank and you see the reaction from all the sharks and they go, and they write down the little note and they go, ooh, that's got good margin. Yes. Right? That's absolutely. that's what you have to, that's the part of your business that you have to develop right from the get-go. Yeah. You can't pick up margin later on. That's, right. a, that's a misnomer. Well, and I will tell you very proudly that that's, yeah. if there's only one reason to hire us, it's for that particular component. And we're very good at marketing. Right. Excellent at it, actually. But production, we've just done it for so long. Um, for over 25 years, um, and most of that's done, uh, most of that time has been done overseas, that we're really good at making sure that we buy the product right so we have margin. And that, and that is the most look at, that's important That's the one key thing. word that you and I both said from different angles. You you know, you know, in real estate, me in automotive, the, you don't make your money on the sale. You make, make your money the purchase. in the purchase. Right. It's, it's about how well you purchase a product. It's how well you bought a used car. It's how well you, you, you buy something. Well, it's happening right now, Pete, in the automobile business, <laughs> yeah. coincidentally, and in real estate. Right. The There's markets are going crazy right now. So if you're buying a home or you're buying an automobile right now, um, three or four years from now, you're going to take a hit. Um, there's, there's no question about it. There, it's at its all-time high in both areas right now because of the pandemic and because of shortages and um, computer right. chips that we talked to about in our last episode. Um, yeah, you're, this is the wrong time to be buying real estate and the wrong time to be buying vehicles because they're overpriced. Um, so you're not going to be buying them right and then having margin left over in either one of those areas. Exactly. Uh, yeah, people that are buying in high-value markets and moving to lower-value markets – they're probably still paying too much, but that's, that, that hit won't be as big. Right. But if you're staying in the same market and, and flipping your house now or, or flipping your car right now, it's, uh, yeah, like you said, at some point you're going to pay the piper. So uh, it always comes down to you. your cost to produce something has to reflect the margin. And that's really the key because you have to pay, you know, there has to be enough to pay all the bills, all the shipping, all the cost of acquisition, all the marketing, all the storage and warehousing fees. And so if you're not building in margin right away, um, that's, that's, there's no chance of recovery of that. And again, that is also part of, like you said, they look at the fourth question they always ask is, well, you know, what's your scale up plan? Like, how do you scale? Right. And, and it's not just scale and production, right? It's how do you, how do you scale your sales? And so you're looking at that from, from both sides. And again, with our team online, it really is just finding more fishing holes that you can effectively spend money and find customers who will buy. Right. Um, and, and, you know, look at, I just look at it this way. 
Main Street has a limit, right? It's the people in your community. Online, there's no limit. There's a million people out there online right now buying something. Right. Every second. And so you just have to be there and you have to show up when they are. And that's 24-7, 365. That doesn't let, Main Street no longer shuts down. And so you cost effectively have to be there. Um, the fifth question that they always ask, and I'm, I'll ask you why they, why you think they ask that, but how much does, like, a shark's going to want to know, how much do you have invested personally? Right. In, That's in, a great question. They, they do ask that. They, you know, they're not going to invest, first of all, if you haven't invested any money in your own idea, then you don't believe in your idea. Yeah. We've talked about that in other episodes as well. Um, you've got to believe in your own idea enough to actually put some skin in the game. Um, and I get it. There are some people that just literally don't have anything to put in and, and they have terrific ideas and they're looking for friends and family to help them out and we encourage that as well but you know anybody that invests in you they're going to want to make sure that you've invested in yourself um and i i i have to say this because it kind of irks me every now and then when people say well i've got sweat equity i've got you know i've got so many hours in this and days and months and years and um people everybody has sweat equity in anything they ever do in life whether you're trying to become a better athlete or you're trying to lose weight or yeah we're all putting in what we call sweat equity as you have to do that as a minimum <laughs> i mean that's just expected of you you don't have to say it and if you do have to say it then yeah. really what you're doing is you're making up excuses i, I have a tremendous amount of respect uh, even though i'm not a big fan of the sport because i think it's pretty brutal but it's a little sport called the ufc and the gentleman who came up with the idea um is a very, 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 very small percentage owner of the idea because the people who funded it took ninety five or ninety six percent of the of the of the company. Right. He is extremely proud of the fact that he didn't have the money. He and I look at where I respect him entirely is that I'd be angry at this point knowing that I built it with my sweat equity to that point, and he is still ecstatic and grateful. Of course, that someone pitched in and 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 backed him. Um, and he does not complain one iota, one second that he is a small minority shareholder in a massive, massive industry. Right, that's what you you just use the word massive. I mean, I I would take five percent of a you know hundred billion dollar industry. I mean, but I think do the most math. people's mindset is they be they're like angry. It's not yeah, fair. No. You know, I, we, he deserves at least half. Yeah. No, he doesn't. Yeah. There was a tremendous expense and a tremendous Remember one risk. thing: anybody that puts up the money <laughs> deserves the majority of any business yeah. um they're the ones that are putting the money up they're they, the ones they, that are they at put great money risk. into a failing business that had been around for 15 or 10 you know whatever that story is yeah. and um look at they've done a phenomenal job and collectively they both they all saw something and uh they flourished it and that's that's the important part is is that everybody knows their place and you know i'll, I'll encourage you when you when you understand your place in your business you have tough choices to make you've got to you know getting an investment from someone it always hurts because you never get as much as you think you deserve. And well, that's, yeah, conversely, you, but you, know, you you also exactly you also think that your company's worth more than it is because you have <laughs> spent all the time building it, and that's a fair assessment to make as well. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll say this: time does not equate to equity. No, I um, agree with like, you. Like you know, effort and putting it in, and but generating sales equates to equity. If, yeah. if you're that person that puts in that time and it's generally always constantly generally generating sales, again, this is why salespeople get paid the most out of companies because yeah. if they're, they're, the, they're the necessary evil to generate revenue. Right. Uh, they bring in the, biz, the, the revenue so that everybody else can get paid. Right. That, that's just the way it is. Um, all right, so let's, let's get to Lisa's questions. I think you've got a pretty good idea that, um, I'll just say this bluntly, stop looking at what your idea is worth. It's worth nothing. Uh, I said it here. He's validated <laughs> it. Let's move on from that. Well, and I'll also talk about, well, for, for, you know, it's kind of a segue into Lisa D's marketing questions. Um, folks out there, you've said it, Peter, a hundred times, um, making the product for us, um, although it's, it's taxing and, and we've got some fantastic designs. Matter of fact, our whole crew here at 52 Launch is an amazing crew. We've built yeah. them from the ground up five years ago, hand chosen, some really unbelievable talent. Um, uh, it's, it's the reason that our company is successful is that it's the people that work here and they love, we don't even call it work. I've said that in a commercial before. It's, it's, you know, people come, come to have fun, fun every, every day. day and it really, I, I, it sounds corny, but it's the truth here. Um, but again, it's it the pr the production making the product um, is the easier of the two 
beast here, and that's production versus sales. Sales is hard. <laughs> it's it's uh, it, you need the most patience that you possibly can have w when you're in sales, um, and it, it's most important aspect of bringing a product to market. You've got to get to sales, which then now we can start to talk about marketing because without marketing dollars, if you don't have any anything budgeted for marketing, um, it's just it's going to be very difficult to launch a product. Um, and it's one of the things that our uh, production team, um, which you wouldn't think this would be the case, but it is, um, they understand um, that they have to make sure that they manufacture the product cost effectively so we have money left over right. for production for uh, marketing. They understand that because they also want to see that product um, come to fruition. They're proud of, of developing products like the entrepreneur is proud of inventing the product. So we all work hand in hand to get to a point where we have money left over for what we're going to talk about next. And that's marketing dollars. Well, and I'm going to tell you, I think the, the, I'm going to flip the mindset because I think most people that it really people, what, what we're talking about here is converting all of our clients and, and, and entrepreneurs or inventors into business people because there's a huge difference right an entrepreneur is someone who loves being creative get get you know starting something and launching a, a company um at that point you have to transition to becoming a business and and when you are when you're an entrepreneur you're looking at costs you're trying to be cost effective and it's all about what your investments are and but the reality is you have to you kind of have to look at it the other way you can't look at marketing as a cost marketing is a reality and you have to build it into your product. So if, if you aren't allowing, I'm just going to throw a number out there, $10, $12, $15 per product or a percentage of your product sales to marketing, then you're you're not looking at it the right way. You have to understand that you're, a lot of your expense is going to be towards marketing. And starting from scratch, that number is going to be higher than anybody likes. But as you develop sales and as you learn and as you adjust and as you know where to go and find customers or where your marketing dollars are turning into a return on that investment that is when you become an efficient business and you can do then you can spend more effectively strong you can put more money into it and measure it and make sure that you're you're acquiring your customers uh at a, at a cost effective rate can you explain pe so people because i know yep. people raise their eyebrows and they're embarrassed to say that they don't understand this yep. in, during our meetings and, and i always make sure that yeah, yeah, they no. understand it um what why is it that you know, the cost of acquiring a customer starting out might be $15, but over a period of time, it drops down to six. Like explain that to the audience. Like, why is it, why is it such a drastic difference? So what uh, happens? So again, why does it get lower? I'll, I'll tell you the three stages without research and development, meaning, you know, someone with expertise that can say, Hey, you have this widget. And I think this widget would sell well to women over 35 who have children who uh, are married uh, in a household, in, you know, that have two incomes, you, you know, that is your first starting point. At that point, when you feel you've identified the target and you uh, you know how to go into Facebook in the back end or you know how to go into well, Amazon. Even before that. So yep. how do you even know that that's the person that you're looking for? Like you just named off married women with three kids. and I, Like how do you even, what what research and development went into figuring out that that's your, your, that you're most likely well, so I'll, I'll tell you, we, we learned this the hard way. We just thought that's you click those check marks on, uh, you know, the platforms and it just automatically does it. What we quickly learned is that we've hired a team of experts that have spent tens of millions of dollars for other people marketing. So we're starting way, way, way more intelligently than we were if we were doing this on our own. Right. I personally don't believe that anybody without expertise can effectively market online. It is just it's become that super targeted there's a very small group of people that have spent so you would compare it to day trading like i could oh, it's, it's, i know it's, i know stocks but i could not yeah sit down at a desk and analyze companies and know which ones are trending up and which ones i should be buying well i'll, I'll give, I'll give a, a shout to dave portno during the pandemic he became a day trader okay right. davy day trading global or whatever he calls himself but he can afford to lose a million. Like he was down a million and a half dollars. So he invested a million and a half dollars to learn how to become a day trader. Right. And okay. then he made it back. Yeah. Right. It's the same thing with marketing. Yeah. You, you know, a, a big companies will probably spend a million dollars to figure out how to, to fail. acquire that customer yeah. and fail yeah. to learn how to make $10 million on targeting those people. Right. N now, none of our clients can do that. So let's start off with a budget of a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars and 
all we are doing is we are going to fishing holes and testing. We're dropping a little bit of bait in the water. If we get the reactions that we want, we keep fishing there. If we don't, we move to another But spot. dropping that bait into the water is not like going into, you know, the Cape Cod Canal and no. dropping in it there. We're specifically We're looking We're 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 putting it in a area that we're pretty confident that's correct. gonna Correct. Yeah. So so again, the the we have a team of people that um like Sarah will sit there and start to analyze you know, the product itself and look at this, you know, and again, she, her experience comes from a, uh, a large buying background. So she was a buyer for a large box store. So she's looking at what, you know, through her eyes, the consumer level, like sh there's an expertise there. Right. Um, then we have another level of someone who worked online for 15 years. And that all, that's all she does is, is Nikki tracks people who don't want to be found. Right. It's kind of like that. So, Quentin so that's what I was getting to folks. Yeah. I, I want Peter to explain yeah. that there this is no longer hocus pocus marketing because that's exactly what we probably both thought um, early on that it's just yeah you throw it against the wall and you hope it sticks that is not the case here um, we have people that are that we've plucked that are experts and have spent millions of dollars for larger companies yeah um, and again you know they get paid pretty well <laughs> at this company because their expertise is to help with what the sale of the product it's which is what the, the hardest thing. So, so have, it, yeah. it is, and, and I'm going to tell you, it's it's you know it's the five it's the five item rule. It's 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 finding them. It's the the what are we saying to them, right? So the copy has to be written. This is where I work with Sarah on a regular basis. Is that you know she's got the the online copy, but I also have the sales acumen to make sure that the mm -hmm. the keywords are there in terms of making the client actually want to buy something right um then it's the creative right it's it's you can if you don't show people the exact item that makes them go wow and again i, I will say this is where we have just exceeded all my expectations from four years ago to where we are today to be able to capture a very complicated brand new product and you got to understand that none of our clients have products that are um like out there like there's a familiar there's a similar there's something like it but there's nothing like our product so be, be able to explain what we do in three seconds or less is extremely important because that's your clickbait. That's that creative does two things. It gets them to click to actually maybe purchase it. And then all the creative to support the sale and to demonstrate the product and how it works and make it easy and make that purchase that click that buy now easy. The creative is extremely important. Then it really is two people that just know how to place our ads in the right place and target them. And so again, having between the two of them, probably about $25 million in spend and 15 to 20, you know, probably 30 years collectively between the two of them um, to be able to click all the buttons in the back end and make sure that we're showing up where we need to show up when we need to show up. Right. So for example, when someone types in the keyword or that phrase into Amazon and we show up in our listing there and we're an exact match. It's like the matching game. Like when we were kids, you flip the cards and you'd, you'd match cards and you'd pick them up. Yeah. Well, if those two match, you have made a perfect connection to someone who found exactly what they were looking for right. the first time they looked. And then you take that perfect connection and you multiply you, that, right? By going after the same type lookalike. So, so this is where, you know, I'll, I'll put Evan into who is also our, our producer, our executive producer on, on this uh, podcast. But his analytical and our analytical minds collectively as a group are always looking at what can we do to lower our costs and increase our sales? Because ultimately that's how you get volume. Are we allowed to say where Evan's from prior to your prior job? No, no I guess no, we're not. It's a secret again. So, <laughs> so this is a challenge. I do. We, and that goes with the entire team. Yeah. There is a secret and I cannot share right. um, on podcast. I'm sure when you get to meet the team, we'll, we'll be happy to explain yeah. in a one-on-one -on -one setting with some non-disclosures in place. Put it this um, way. He worked for somebody pretty famous. Yeah. <laughs> so. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll leave that alone. Right. <laughs> um, so look at the, that. That's that's the marketing in a nutshell. It is, it is like you said, it is no longer a uh, look and see. Uh, I, I love clients and I appreciate the fact that everyone thinks that they can be a DIY wire in online marketing. Uh, you cannot. Now, I will tell you there is one or two examples that we have that if you suck at marketing and you don't want to spend a dime in marketing, there is things that you could do to go out and hustle the crap out of your product, right? Absolutely. QB54. Great example. <laughs> Those guys, I mean, Mike and his brother Frank are the two most 
extraordinary hustlers I've ever met. Don't, they forget, will, the, don't forget his son. He's pretty, and his son pretty too. talented yeah, himself. That, that he's whole like family 12. goes out and goes <laughs> and hustles their product to a point where they finally reach this tipping point. And I'm so proud of them that they are just blowing up online. Um, but again, even them, they converted to marketing when it became, once they understood where, where and how to spend the money. Um, and you know, again, uh, yeah. it's a combination of both. I can remember conversations with, um, with them that, you know, there were hard conversations to have on the phone because um, yeah. we, you know, they weren't getting the, the they were stout. sales that uh, they were hoping for when they first started marketing. And, um, you know, those were hard conversations to have because the product is amazing. It's just, yeah. it, it was a product that took some explaining. To, it it was. Know, and, it, it and, was and, a new product, brand new. Uh, yeah. Nothing else competed with it. And I highly recommend if they've got any in stock right now, go to playqb54.com and order yeah. yourself a set. They're great for beaches, uh, but, backyard barbecues. Right. But that's a company that um, um, many people will, will, will say they're an instant yeah. success that took, you know, yeah. five or six, seven years to get to that point. So, yeah. um, you know, kudos to them because they have done exactly what entrepreneurs need to do they have to have patience they got to grind it out um, and they're proof that without any marketing dollars they've managed to um, to build sales um, not as quickly as they wanted to but um, now that they're there and they have some profits to reinvest into marketing dollars they're blow they are blowing up you're yeah right. no uh, just incredible um, so uh, again Lisa's question first one is what is the average spend on running a social media ad campaign uh, so look at solid question in the beginning, I'm going to say it's an investment. You need to be prepared to spend three to four thousand dollars. Now you will get some of that back. Um, the way we look at it and the way we measure it is the keywords that you're going to hear and learn from us is cost of acquisition and then ROAS. ROAS is return on ad spend. And because we've already done the job in terms of margin, and again, because we we developed the process to make sure that we always have enough margin for all of our clients, I, I we have the flexibility to understand that. If I can spend a dollar and generate three dollars in return on advertising, or a thousand dollars and get three thousand dollars back, we're generally in that position where we have enough margin in all of our products that that is actually a profitable business. Um, in small scale, if I if we get to a point, let's say in the first month, that we find the perfect fishing hole, and that fishing hole tells us we can buy an unlimited amount of customers at eight dollars and sell a product for forty dollars. It, now it really comes to the reverse math problem. How much could I spend to sell out right now? All right, this is the thing is that you, you it's up to you if you wanna do it over a month or a year. But it comes down to if you have a thousand products at eight, uh, you know. Yeah, you have to have inventory. So and or, that's why we call it. You are limited by your inventory. That's why we call it, a, you know, are you scalable? And uh, if you do not have enough inventory, then you can't scale. Meaning that um, if we do find that magical hole that if we spent, we we're spending a thousand to generate three, all of a sudden, if Nikki says, guys, I mean, if we spent $10,000, we would sell $30,000 worth of product. Um, guess what? We can't spend the 10 because we don't have enough inventory to warrant the sale. And the kiss of death online is if you can't deliver. So, yeah. so, so that's the big challenge, which you goes back to our last segment when we talked about some of the smarter entrepreneurs that we not I, that's a bad word not smart some of the um the entrepreneurs that the increase business the business savvy. they 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 understand that they want to make sure they don't run out of inventory they have that um inclination that they they're onto something here and they're going to spend some marketing dollars but they want to make sure that they have the inventory to support that um, you know that's why they they'll buy ten thousand units of something so they can now scale a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so that's well, I, I use the magic number. So again, if you if you have a thousand units in inventory and you know that it costs you eight dollars to acquire a customer, that means you've got to invest eight thousand dollars in advertising. Right. You want to do it this month? Go ahead. Right. Because you know that you can spend eight thousand. There's enough volume out there that you can sell out of your entire thousand. Right. Well, let's say you wanted to have 10,000 units in stock. So you, you're spending $80,000. Right. You can divide that over 12 months. Or you yeah. can divide that in three months. Yeah. And many people are like, well, I don't have $80,000 to spend. N nobody well, does. Yeah, you don't. But if you, if you can now show an investor that Correct. you can actually sell uh, $80,000 worth. No, actually, if you're spending $80,000 yeah. a month, you're on, selling. On a $40 item or a $30 yeah. item. I mean, these, this is live lunch I'm using it as the example, yeah. right? So that's $436,000 to 
that you would generate in sales right. on an eighty thousand dollar. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that anybody and everybody would spend that kind of money if Correct. it's gonna if it's gonna generate five or four times um, that spend, um, and that's exactly what the investors look for. They, they they have no problem investing in something like that because the returns significant. Well, I just gave you an example that if you spent you know eighty thousand dollars in a one year period to sell 12,000 units of lava lunch or $96,000, you'd be at $432,000 in revenue. I can't remember if it was on this episode or last episode, right. but to be acquired by a large company, they're looking for $500,000 in sales yeah. at a minimum. So exactly. there you go. In one in one one product, one purchase, you're at $500,000 in one year. Right. You know, now, is that easy? No. But I will tell you, there's a couple of secrets we learned, right? And let's talk about marketing is that um, when you get to the point where you can prove to Amazon over a consistent, you know, twelve, you know, six month to twelve month basis, they'll actually reverse the flow for you, and they'll say, "Hey, we're we're going to fund your marketing dollars. We're just going to take it out of sales." And why do they do that for you? Because they want you to sell more, and they don't want you to have a burden of cash flow. Yeah, and, which goes back to they want you to sell more, but the most important thing is they don't want you to run out of inventory. Exactly. So they'd rather you put your money into inventory. <laughs> exactly. They'll take care of the marketing dollars because it's their platform anyway. So they're giving you air. Right. All right. They're charging you for something that they're in control of anyway. So it's not like they're going out on a television buy right. with your money. Right. So they're basically financing your marketing spend. Right. Which gives everybody cash flow, which is an un, like I don't think it's an underestimated value that we can all say Amazon sucks. It's hard. It's done. But to me, that is the one asset that if you can get to on Amazon and you need to get to on Amazon, it frees up your capital to go out and get more inventory. And worry about the financing of your of yeah. your eighty thousand dollars spend later. And so you said the word sucks. Amazon sucks. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm going to share something with you. Um, they don't suck. No. <laughs> okay. Um, Walmart sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so comparatively, uh, exactly. So and in context, yeah. If you think Amazon sucks, you have to deal with the red tape in doing business with Walmart. It's a walk in the park dealing with Amazon. They do take their fees and that's why they're the richest company in the world and one of the richest men in the world uh, owns it. But um, you know, their platform is, um, again, I've used this a hundred times, it equals, it levels the playing field for everybody. Um, we all can't get into Walmart with our product, um, but we can all get into Amazon with our product. So it's not easy to get Amazon, but once you're in there, uh, you can yeah. make money. So I love Lisa's second question because I think this kind of wraps it up in, 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 in a very clear, concise. At what point do you expect to see a return on my marketing investment? So there's two parts to marketing, right? There's that learning curve and then there's the what I can expect. We just did the calculation on what we can expect. Spend $8, $8 times 80000 We sh We will sell out of our 12,000 or 10,000 units. But... I expect that we, again, the goal from onset is that we expect to get a return on every dollar we spend. Does that mean it happens in the first day? No. no. Does it happen in the first month? Yeah, it, it does. Maybe not in every campaign that we ran, but in several campaigns that we isolated and we targeted, we are already there. Now, does that mean they're the best fishing holes? Like This is really a matter of having thousands of fishing spots that you're fishing in simultaneously to get the volume that you need. And the more that you do that, that is where you can always guarantee a, a return on your investment. Right. Now, every time you ask the question, and I'll, I'll point to you directly, every time you say, I want to sell more, what that means is we're going to disrupt the current state of our situation. We're going to go out and go find new fishing holes. There's an investment to each time we do that. And what you're going to see for a short period of time is that your cost of acquisition is going to go up because I'm spending money probably where I shouldn't to learn. And my return on ad spend is going to go down because, again, I'm spending money where I shouldn't. But once I have that data and once Evan and the team analyze it and once we realize, okay, that worked, that didn't work, boom, those two hit jackpots, that is when we get probably the same CAC probably the same return on ad spend, but our volume goes up dramatically. Right. In fact, that's where our ROAS does increase because now I might have gone from a three to a 3.5 or, th or four times ROAS. And that's that's constantly what we're doing. And right. it's, it's not day trading anymore, it's scaling. And it's gotten better over the years because what reason? Well, we have more clients. Right. So, so we're actually testing on other similar products that are gonna 
possibly be in the same space. So we already have what we feel is a great fishing hole to begin with. So Correct. that's why we get better faster. Um, and, and, and we haven't even looked at yet at that point because we don't really focus on that because to me that's a natural progress. But at some point, the more inventory you get out there, the more people using it, the more people are going to share it, Absolutely. like it. And that's where your cost of acquisition comes down because when you reach that tipping point and the brand of the people love your product and are sharing your product, that those have zero cost of acquisition. Right. Right. So that's that's really what every company needs to get to. And again, you can do that with a single product today. You could do that with a single product today. I say that over and over because on Shark Tank, Mr. Wonderful says uh, you can't be a business with a single product. And I completely disagree. The largest growing segment in the market is what we talked about. It's the acquisition of single products that do extremely well in e-commerce. Right. Well, yeah. that, that, that venture has just taken off in the last 18 months. So we'll give uh, Mr. <laughs> Wonderful a... Uh, yeah. A, a hall pass on that because I think he would disagree with his own statement today. I, I do think that as well. Yeah. Um, so I, next question is the yeah. obvious answer. Um, <laughs> so I'd say ninety percent of our <laughs> have ad, you had ad campaigns that just completely fail and don't see any uh, uh, ROI? And the answer to that question is oh, I'd say ninety nine percent of them fail. We're looking for the one percent, right? <laughs> right? So this is this is like extreme fishing. Now I will say in failure comes success. Exactly. If you don't fail, you can't succeed. Now the the strategy here is it's a matter how much money you invested in failure, right? right? So if I, again, like I said, large companies will, will invest 30 to $50,000 in an hour to go out and learn and test this to, to then determine because they can afford where to. to spend the million right. dollars because they can afford to do that. Right. In our case, we're spending small dollar amounts to fail fast and learn quickly. And, when you and say small dollar amounts, so, so the audience knows. 25 to $30 Exactly, uh, so campaign. it's not, you know, you can, again, you can have a small budget for marketing and still be effective. Yep. Um, it's just you'll be a little less effective than if you had a little bit more. Well, because of our budget and because of our strategy, we have to go find low-hanging fruit first, right? Like we want to get the easy acquisitions. That might cost maybe 2 to $3 more in cost of acquisition, but they're consistent. And they're going to be there every time we go out and spend $1,000, right? Because we want to get that return. We want to get that consistency in sales. You know, as we get more budget and more time and more money and more education and more data to, to support the analytics, you know, we want to take more risk. We'd want to spend $1,000 in somewhere we know, you know, didn't give us the preliminary, pre preliminary uh, data that we were looking for. But uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, Pinterest is a really, really good example, right? Someone who has a product that has to be at the seed idea point is a perfect Pinterest um, uh, advertising platform. The challenge with Pinterest is that I showed you an idea. You're probably not going to execute on that dia idea. Um, like let's say, you know, it's a closet organizer. If you're looking to ways to organize your closet and you've been on Pinterest today, that doesn't mean you're going out to tomorrow to get your closet organized. You, you, it's a project that you're going to put in motion. So you're going to find that the money you're investing there is three, is three months down the road before they make a purchase. So is that why when I go and on Pinterest and I find something that I like, I click on it, I, I, I can't find it to buy. It's like weird. It's yeah, like, so it doesn't Pinterest, even take me to a link to actually yeah, buy Yeah, so Pinterest is, is, is just one of those things that I think most people use it as like a pin board to show ideas and yeah. examples. Um, we use it for marketing, right? right? So on our products, you would actually be able to click it, it would show up when you're oh, in your seat, that's search. Good. Yeah, the, the only challenge is, is that again, if you're an instant gratification person, right, right you wanna spend a dollar today and get a dollar today, right. uh, or your $2 back today, um, with Pinterest, you'll spend the dollar, which will result in a sale in, in 30 days, okay. 60 days, 90 days from now. Um, whereas someone on Amazon who is searching for something that they, you know, people don't go on Amazon to think about buying something. They go on Amazon because they already know they're buying something. Usually now, Amazon's the last stop. They're, yeah, they're going I know I'm a, buying something. Yeah. It's like walking into, you know, a, a Walmart, I almost said Zellers because I'm Canadian, but Walmart yeah. and, and uh, Kmart and all these places, uh, Target, you go in there not to shop around. You go in there because you need to pick something up. Right. Um, and they know that the more they make you walk around, you pick up some extra things. Right. Well, Amazon's the same way. That's why they show you the also bought down at the bottom. They, you know, show up deals at the top. They, they you know, they, they know how to get you to spend more money. But when you type kind in of like the word, TJ Maxx, where they have the whole line that you're getting up to the register yeah. full of candy and chips and yeah. all the stuff everyone there's a and I, get, I guarantee you when you talk to someone there who knows exactly what the percentage of people that pick up and what the dollar item is they have that down to a science yeah. um but yeah so you know every campaign is going to fail uh our job is to make sure we find the ones that succeed and fund the ones that succeed so lisa's next question is what are the additional costs um such you know, such as domain hosting and social media ads 
you know, can we elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, for us, I'm going to give uh, Shopify a plug. You know, it's twenty nine dollars for for the um, good platform. I'd probably even go up to the seventy nine dollar platform a month uh, to give you the more integration towards uh, your um, your accounting software. Like we, you know, we yeah. use. Uh, so why do we use Shopify versus uh, a competitor? Because all the e commerce things that we could never think about have been thought about by millions upon millions of people that have been using Shopify and all the developers that can that that use Shopify to develop to develop carts. Um, so not only do we spend money on Shopify, we spend money to buy a theme, someone who has thoroughly thought out the e commerce process. Because really, in e commerce, it's it, you don't you're not successful online unless you have the you know how to collect and analyze the data, and that's really where Shopify integrates everything that is needed to. I call it the Captain Kirk chair, right? The old school Star Trek uh, uh, reference, but where all the information comes to the captain's chair. I can look at I can look at Shopify in an instant and know exactly what happened today, where every sale came from. Did it get delivered? Did it not get delivered? Uh, you know, which ad got the got the deal there? And it just gives me all the analytics that are needed to make better decisions on what to do and where to spend the advertising dollar. Who's the largest uh, pro, uh, platform, uh, e-commerce platform? For us, uh, look, it, it's, who, it's, who is the largest in the marketplace? Well, so WordPress is probably the largest platform for websites, right. I'd say. But Shopify, Squarespace, those are the ones that are in the e-commerce we just prefer Shopify because of the flexibility. Um, again, just something simple. I don't have to set up a merchant account. They've right. done that, right? right? So if you're a new business, all I got to do is give them a credit card. They run it through their credit processing system. They get better uh, rates. They connect to all the fulfillment centers. Uh, you know, if I want to even do my own drop ship but in, and connect with the uh, uh, ship uh, ship station or one of those advertised. Um, what's the most? What's most sought after phone? Well, I'd say Samsung, but yeah, globally. Yeah, okay. <laughs> What's the most, I don't even believe that. What's the most sought after phone, Evan? The iPhone, right? So there's a reason the iPhone's the most sought after phone. It's, it's you know, the UI experience yeah. is awesome. The, it's just a cult following of people that use Apple products. And we have chosen Shopify for a reason. We, we yeah. like their um their platform, it's it's user friendly. It's That's got the really most the analytics. Is that you said the most important thing that uh, there's another company out there? I think I don't forget who you said, but does Square. websites? Oh, uh, yeah. WordPress. Well, yeah, WordPress. We're not a website. We we, no. we build your site, but it's not a website. It's a e-commerce yeah. platform site that it's a page where people go and buy from. Um, we're not going to build you a website that's going to talk about who you are and. Um, it's unnecessary. It, it, Show yeah. people an ad. People are, they just want to get to the product. We led them to the product through an ad and they want to make a decision to buy immediately. They so there are some maintenance costs to that. There's no hosting fee, but you're paying them to maintain a website, make sure your, you know, your credit card, if it changes, that's your most important. That is your transactional site. Right. Um, there is a cost to being on, on Amazon and we do recommend, not recommend, we absolutely, you have to have uh, Amazon Pro. Or else you have it's just it's useless. You, you know, uh, even then, I highly recommend on Amazon you take the time to invest in your brand and get yourself trademarked because if you're a brand registered on Amazon, you get even more bells and whistles. So these are just little things that uh, are additional learned cost. Over but are, the last but are, five years, that um, yeah, it's just information that uh, and, and these are not costs; these are yeah. investments. Yeah, right. There's, there's a return on this investment. Yeah. you get something in return for the efficiency and what they provide. Um, and again, I will tell you, there's savings. What, if you built, if you wanted to build your own e-commerce site as effectively as the Shopify platform, you'd be in the twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars range, at a minimum. Right. And you still wouldn't be. There'd still be things you forget, and it's an ongoing cost. So, um, again, all this can be done without us. But yeah. we have just uh, through the years, have um, well, we have the ability to build our own websites to this level. And we don't, right? Right? It's, it's it's just because there's an entire group of people making it better every day. Um, what is the additional cost of hiring us as a marketing online team? Look at there is a cost to that because it's really just a management team. Again, we treat it like we've done everything else. We, uh, you know, there's five to ten people on that team at a given time. We charge a fraction of that. Uh, it's less than the cost of one employee that you would hire uh, at a very short or part-time basis to have us manage the entire team to get started. After that, it really comes down to making you know making it fair so that we're in tune with just maintaining 
there um, and, and minimizing our costs there or helping you grow to that point where we might have to add people to your team specifically to help make sure that we are reaching the growth that you want every day, every month, every year on your product. So um, there, there is a cost, but again, it's extremely affordable like everything else that we do around here. And what is the additional cost to hire um, or the, I guess you just answered that. I'm sorry. Yep. Can one person handle uh, the Got average it. number of inquiries? Um, oh, inquiries. Yeah. Yeah. Not Facebook, the marketing, but inquiries. Facebook com uh, comments and, well, I need to hire additional people Look, to help with customer service. In the, service. in the beginning, you can just ignore it. Right. <laughs> it's not a good idea, right. but I don't think the volume is there enough. Um, again, it's, it's the person that has to respond to inquiries has to really learn to sometimes not say too much or just say the perfect thing or analyze like is it really a detrimental thing like if someone's complaining because of the product they wish that something fit better or stored better right something that's out of our control i'd ignore that well correct me if i'm wrong and um, mm -hmm. this is a lot of question and I'm, hopefully i don't open a can of worms here but yeah, you could. um <laughs> uh part of our um part of hiring us for the marketing do, do, do we not include somebody that manages the comments? No, we we, we, we will train you to do it. And yeah. of course, we'll support you to do it. Because at the end of the day, look at the, the person wants to hear from the person at the, you know, the, the customer care rep. Right. We can we can do some of the, you can teach us what to say. But when it comes down to making a decision to send somebody their money back or send them product back, that shouldn't be us. That right. should be you. If your policies, when you get to that point where your policies are clear enough and this is what you're going to do, you know, your fulfillment center actually is the better partner for that. They can handle your returns and they can handle your call center and they can do all those things for you. So there's people you can hire. I just like the fact that, you know, someone like Glenn from Deep Sleep does an amazing job yeah. being the voice of his own product and his own brand. And I think that's where he needs to stay. Well, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, that was kind of a rhetorical question because I, I already have my own answer, yeah. <laughs> as I usually do when I <laughs> ask a question. Um, it would be an awesome problem to have yes. that you would need somebody to respond to a ton of uh, emails, right? That means the volume's there, um, and at that point in time, a lot of things can happen. Um, you know, well, we do we do a tremendous amount of volume with a lot of our client products, and we really there isn't a lot of social media interaction, so to speak. Very few complaints. Again, you know, if you bring a bre a bad product to market that keeps breaking or keeps failing, yeah, you're going to be pretty busy. And then at that point, you know, you've got to reevaluate. Again, part of our process to make sure that the communication channels are pretty quiet. Now, really, what you have to manage is the freaking smart asses, right? The person that comes out and like just says something stupid. Um, well, or, give them an example. We have we have a product now that there are people bash every day, and it's a fantastic well, so, product. Yeah, it's so, unshrink so, it. So unshrink it. So it's actually an exa a great example. Right. Unshrink it is a um, uh, you know, a patent pending and should be patented by the end of this uh, quarter um, that helps unshrink wool sweaters. If you throw them in the dryer, it, it, it unshrinks it. Now, even though we, we explain that, you know, if it's a wool cotton blend, that doesn't, if the cotton shrinks, I can't unshrink your cotton. Wool has a natural curly fiber. We get a lot of people giving the homemade remedy of, yeah, you could just use hair conditioner. And, and look at, there's a certain part to that that is true. It is part of the process, but the problem with hair conditioner is that all the other chemicals that go into them uh, to straighten your hair and smell your hair, and it adds so much weight to your clothes that you will actually shrink it longer term. It's not a healthy solution for unshrinking sweaters. It is a life hack out there, and you can walk, watch all kinds of YouTube videos, but it's not the best way to do it. So to me, that is, I appreciate that someone's trying to save them money and in, in, in the wool sweater business. But if you spent nine hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars on a hundred dollars on, a, yeah. on your or, favorite sweater, right? Or it's something that your grandma knit for you and you shrunk yeah. the gloves that you know that are an heirloom. Yeah, uh, use something that's been properly engineered by a team of of I will say chemists. solution friendly <laughs> chemists. Like you know that these aren't harsh chemicals that that um, that do their job effectively. Right. Um, so look at that, that, that's a good example, but well, yeah. again, the, the, I, I wanted you to talk about that briefly, but the other yeah. aspect is that the, you know, someone says they couldn't unshrink their cotton sweater and it, it's specifically designed to bring unshrink back natural, natural fibers sweaters, where, you know, you know, so any, anything that's curly, we even explain that, you know, what's, um, what's the rabbit, uh, the Angora, right? That that doesn't, it, those are straight haired. So if you shrink that, first of all, it's hard to shrink that. 
But if you if you try to do that, there's nothing to uncurl. There's nothing that straightens up. Right. Wool is a naturally cur curly fiber. So when you shrink it in the heat, it goes back to its natural curly state. Right. We then relax that 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 fiber and it turns into it goes back to its natural straight yeah. state or unnatural state. Straight so state. we br we bring this up not to educate you on our, our unshrink it our product that helps unshrink sweaters. We do it because we do have to answer to those. Yeah. Uh, comments uh, on a regular basis and we do just that we just explain just the same way we just explained to you and uh that's part of owning a business um it's part of uh you know trying to develop a good um right you know a good a good score a good product score online well, good and, reviews. and i teach people that those are objections that you have to learn to overcome yeah. because you know objections is <laughs> the alternative would be not to have any objections which means you're not selling anything right, exactly. so um, we don't want that to be the case exactly um, is there a method for releasing slow? Um, so, so we have, I have the ability to handle the volume and then ramp up over time. So the other word yeah. for that is scale up, right? Yeah. It's, uh, do, yes. do you guys help scale? And the answer to that question is yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And, and yeah. again, you know, for us, what we really had to learn as a company is to identify, you know, when you, when I just make, or we make the assumption that, you know, everyone is doing this on a budget. We're now at the point where, you know, we have a realistic conversation about where you want to start and where you want to scale to. If our starting point is 500 units, yes, we can, we, 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 we've been very successful with getting 500 units. We just had a, a reorder from two years ago, something, the uh, lobster nativity scene. Yeah, it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you can go check them out. It's a nativity set that is designed by a really unique artist uh, that lives on the Cape and she created this crustacean set of uh, of the nativity scene um phenomenally successful yeah. uh very very unique very uh, high quality um but you know again we started a very small scale with someone who has no concept or ability to be online uh doesn't you know has difficulty emailing and we're at the point now where you know this year there's there's another 2000 pieces coming and we're going to sell them out this year right um so you know there there is a slow and grow model I would encourage that when you get to the point of sell them out at two hundred dollars a piece. By the way, yeah, or two fifty. Yeah. I think. I don't, yeah, how much are they? Two fifty. Two hundred fifty dollars yeah. for a set. Yeah. Um, uh, apparently, nativity scenes are expensive. <laughs> I well, didn't realize and, and it. Just yeah, the, the I should know the, better. The response that we had on the first five hundred sales, just the people and the support and the, the love that that got shared, is incredible. So, um, you know, you just never know, and, and every product has its own place and its own way to speak. And if the entrepreneur sees that there's a there's someone else that they feel would like it, then you know, you can turn that you can turn anything into a business. I'd say this all the time: yeah. there is way shittier products online that sell every day in the millions. That you know, if you're afraid to bring a mediocre product to market, just bring it to market. Right. Right. And our job is to make it a better than mediocre product that actually develops something and goes and put it in their you just got to put it in the right, in front of the right, right people. Right, exactly. Every, every, right uh, people. what do they say? They're every seat, they're every ass has a seat, right? Like yep. it's, every product has a place to be sold. How um, many units do you expect to sell online, average-wise, per day, week, and month? And, of course, that's the billion-dollar question. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, look, I don't, think there, I don't think there is a limit. I mean, I think there's a cap. Um, you know, in a search world, there's only so many people that might search for something every day. But even that's in the millions. Right. I, I don't think any of our clients are in the are ever going to be in a position where they saturate the market. Yeah, yeah. I, I think once you know how to find the million people that are going to buy your product, if you had the money to spend the 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 you know million times eight dollars, yeah. you know you could you could sell out inventory in one day online. Right. What is the best, most effective, and efficient, uh, profitable platform? And I think we talked about that already. We talked about Shopify, right? Yeah. Is that the question she's well, asking? Well, so, so look, at, to me, the biggest two, the two biggest centers um, or transaction points is the way I look at it is your own website, which we use Shopify or Amazon, right? Like, and I'll give you an example. On Shrink, it's a good one. We spend all our money in advertising on Facebook. Facebook is where we go hunting for people. Right. Amazon is where we go and try and match keywords. So on Facebook, I show people that I know are interested in sweaters or fashion or wool or whatever that triggers those keywords, and I show them the unshrink it product in front of them. Guess where they buy that product from? You know, it clicks to our website. Yep. They buy it on Amazon. Right. Right. So for whatever reason, I don't, I couldn't tell you why, but you know, we we sell 
thirty percent. Actually, we sell eighty percent of our stuff on Amazon and twenty percent on our website. Right. But all our advertising dollar is geared towards selling. You know, showing people on Facebook that should be buying from our website. So, uh, I think what they end up doing is they go on our website, then they go search Amazon. It's the same reason that people, instead of going to uh, United Airlines and buying a ticket on United, yep. you think that would be the cheapest way to go is to buy it right from the, right from the. Direct from the source. Direct from the source, but people will go to Kayak. And they'll yep. they'll go to Travelocity, or they'll go to some other uh, platform to to buy it because they feel like they're getting a better deal where more right. people are going. And Amazon's that case. I mean, so so the point I was making to me, the online platform has to be both. You have to have your ecom right. and your Amazon because it doesn't matter where the cons where it's, the consumer is going to feel more comfortable checking out where they feel more comfortable. Right. If they're comfortable on your website, they'll check out there. If they if they like to buy on Amazon, look at I'll equate this. I you know with three kids, I actually I won't let my kids buy things online with a credit card if I don't trust the site. So I tell them automatically to make my life easier. Just send me the link on Amazon. If it's on Amazon, right. I'll buy it for you because it's a one click. It's done. It'll be here. And we know how hard it is to get products on Amazon, so we know that they're yeah. secure. Exactly. I I, I'm, I trust that we're not going to get you know. Uh, I'm not going to wake up one day and the you know credit cards wiped out because you know it was a bad site or it was a phishing site. Well, so. your credit card won't get wiped out as long as you give it to your kids. Yeah, <laughs> that's the <laughs> second reason. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to wrap up with the, uh, one of the last questions that um, Lisa asked us, and it's a question that a lot of people ask us, and um, it's about financing. Um, you know, what do most of our clients do for financing? What percentage of our clients use their own personal savings? Um, you know, what's the perfect loan to take out? Uh, is there a recommendation on, you know, giving up equity in your company early on? Um, you know, how do I get a small business loan? Some of those questions. And those are all great questions um, that are uh, pretty much all of our entrepreneurs ask. Um, yeah. Um, look, at in, in every business, in, in every idea, at some point, you can only go so far with sweat equity it's at a certain point to turn it into a real business you've got to make investments and you've got to have some money for investments to answer the question where our clients get it from i'll be honest my simple answer is i'm always amazed that they have come up with the money right i, I think this is something as much as i i've always had that belief as a salesperson to say never you know again from the car business everyone <laughs> told me my entire life i know we don't I have any money say that um <laughs> including so, myself I have my budget's like 300 dollars a month and right. i leave so, it spending so, uh, 800 so if i believe that from everybody that came into the car industry i would not be good at the car industry right so the first thing you learned and say is like okay everybody has money because they're here to, they need a car so they're going to figure out the money part right and that's really the same thing that i'm just amazed that people have figured out i, I think you know um two things you know, I, I think everybody has a safe bet and they don't, you know, no one's breaking, no one's betting the farm and, and, you know, but again, whatever they're, they're allocating towards this, we take it very seriously because we know it's a, it's a major commitment. Um, we also try and save them as much money so that they can get so much further along with the money that we're spending to get a product launched. Uh, you know, I think, look, at if you talk to an accountant or lawyer, the number out there has been $250,000, right? That's what it takes. We've launched companies and products for under 70. Uh, and, I would argue that we've launched them for under 50. Yeah. And no, in a, in a lot of cases, yeah. uh, you know, so you, you're right. Um, it, it really just comes down to, I think what, what our most successful clients have done, uh, know that they can get through the first part and the second part with time comes up, you know, there, there's points where, uh, I don't recommend taking investors where you're giving equity early on. Uh, I definitely believe that friends and family, when you get to that point where you can show them your brand, a product that's that's designed and prototyped and to a point where you're about to make that production order um, and a strategy to get to market, I think that is your most investable friends and family around. That's where some of our clients have really, you know, gone from maybe ordering 500 to ordering 10,000 because right. they've been able to get to that first hurdle because now they've got... Well, the, when, once you get to that first hurdle, and that usually happens in the first 60 days of hiring us, yeah. um, you're actually seeing a, a a real prototype. You're you're seeing you're, the entire you're, execution you're, plan. You're seeing your in branding you. packet, so you kind of have a look and feel of what your company is going to look like, what your transaction page is going to look like. You've yep. got, you know, maybe a little it's, content. I'd say it's a very realistic pitch deck, and yeah. it's not a pitch deck on a piece of paper. 
It's a tangible, right. planned out, executionable. There's no more variables. There's no more uh, questions. Well, we still have to figure this out. You know, again, any entrepreneur that says they've got it all figured out, I can assure you that we don't even flag we don't even I, work with them anymore. Yeah, we don't take them on you. anymore. We've learned our lesson in that. Area. There is there is so much to get worked out. I will we will let you know when everything is figured out. And it comes down to when we know that this is exactly the product we can make and it's the exact cost and there's no surprises coming up. Right. Um, and, but, but yeah, so look at, but every, it, everybody yeah. has a different place. You are, it, Pete, you, you said it and, and I concur. Uh, it, it's amazing um, the people, and again, we have people from all walks of life, um, you know, blue collar, white collar, uh, you name it. And we are amazed at some of the ways that people come up with the money um and it's quite frankly the ones that we didn't think had that type of money that are the most successful as well so they're driven yeah. like nobody's business and um yeah uh, you said it too don't don't give up equity early on uh, you're going to need that you're equity need that for, for um, scale once we start to scale and that's when you give equity up because you're getting something back uh, that's valuable. Um, you're getting a partner or, or an investor back that's smart money. Um, uh, you don't want to uh, divvy up the company on the, the early stages because too many chefs in the kitchen early on is uh, is also a disastrous, uh, out, could be a good disastrous outcome. Yeah. And, and anybody that doesn't bring any money to the table and only brings sweat equity, I would not, I'd put them on payroll. Right. Um, you know, loan them, make it a loan, do whatever. But, the, you know, to me that that equity position, and unless they are the revenue generator and they are bringing in people with money, bringing in sales, pre-sales, orders, somehow funding and floating the company before you even have a company, then that's a different person. That, that's someone that you absolutely want on your team. But you know, you, you, anybody that doesn't contribute financially or to that point where they're generating revenue that you can fund a business for, um, I, I just don't see the ability to, to give equity right. at that point. That's a whole segment we can talk about yeah, too later absolutely. on. All right. Great. I think that wraps up uh, Lisa D's. Uh, yeah, that's a two-parter. It's a pretty long one, but I think it's a, again, we want to give Lisa D a big shout out. We appreciate that uh, these are just incredible questions that um, we don't take for granted. We just live them. And right. we, you know, we have them all answered, but putting them in one place where you can see them, understand them, share them, comprehend them, I think it's just extremely valuable to everybody watching this. Perfect. And just a reminder, we, watched, uh, we want to subscribe yeah, subscribe, follow us, like us. Um, please share us. And again, if you've got questions uh, that you want us to answer, please leave them in the comments or reach out to us by, by email. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, create more podcasts that help you guys get to become inventors, entrepreneurs, and then business people. Great. Have a good day. Great day.